Great, cool. And got that. Everything should sound good. And then I'll mute this one so we don't get feedback. Cool. There we go. All right. Okay, I think we are rolling. Let me just move this over here and move this over here and pull this up over here. And actually, let me pop this chat out and I'll put it on this side of the screen. There we go. And questions, perfect, all right. There we are. So, hey everyone, welcome to The Horror Show. I'm Cecil Laird, and today I am super lucky to be joined by someone that I should have had on the channel a long time ago, considering how long we've technically been working together now at this point. Um, but, uh, but I am here talking to the absolute genius behind so much work that you guys know and love, but spe uh, especially near and dear to my heart, uh, the special effects work for Dylan's New Nightmare. Today I am joined by none other than Nora Hewitt. Nora, welcome to the channel. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Cecil. Of course, of course. It's, uh, it's uh, as I said, long overdue. So let me go ahead and say hello to some of the people in the chat real quick. We've got uh, Sophia Isabel. We've got The Rage Within. We've got Ian Rapash. Uh, we've got Tyler Adams. What's going on? And uh, Dice Rollin' in the chat. Da uh, Producer Dave in the chat as well. So welcome everyone, welcome. We'll give everyone a little bit of time to uh, to filter in here. But Nora, how have you been doing recently? We'll just start there. Pretty damn good. I uh, got through our first hurricane of the season out here in Florida. Everything was uh, a okay. Um, right. But yeah, no, everything's been good. Um, super excited to see all the buzz around the release of Dylan's New Nightmare. That's been just super cool. Um, just glad everyone's receiving it well. I'm super excited for you. Uh, well, for everyone involved, honestly, this is the epitome of, you know, team projects, in, in my opinion, you know, and uh, everyone did their part. Everyone did a wonderful job for the film. And it's gratifying to know that everyone is getting to see how well received everything is. I mean, you know, you can't you can't sniff at a 98 percent like to dislike ratio you know what i mean that's uh, that's pretty good huh. as far as that goes <laughs> um too shabby yeah if only we weren't age restricted then the views would be going up a lot quicker but you know it's okay it's still going up it's still constant we're still getting comments every single day saying they like it you know and the, and the good comments far outweigh the negative ones so yeah it's it's been exciting to see it's definitely been exciting to see uh, Luigi Costa is in the chat as well. Let me go ahead and raise that a little bit. So, guys, I am going to take this opportunity to ask Nora all the questions that I love to ask people when I interview them on the channel. Again, it's long overdue. Uh, Nora has been such a important part of the Dylan's New Nightmare process, not just because of her work, but because of her personality and the fact that, you know, it, Nora's one of those people that when you have her on set, you just absolutely have someone that's positivity, you know, I, I don't remember a time where Nora was negative about anything, even when things weren't necessarily going perfectly um, with certain things, maybe some teeth issues uh, or a teeth issue. Um, never, never was there negativity. So that I very much appreciate just as much as your actual work for what came on camera. So thank you for that. Oh, thanks, man. Of course. Um, all right. So <laughs> producer Dave asks, uh, who's Nora's favorite and why is it me? Uh, <laughs> he's not, he's not wrong. I love you, producer Dave. I think Mahalo is your favorite, honestly. Oh, Mahalo is the man. Um, but uh, all right. We got uh, Han Basolo uh, down there as well. Um well, he'll, he'll, I'll, I'll occasionally break in with some questions as they throw them out, Nora. Guys, if you end up having questions for Nora, just put them in the chat as we go along. Um, I might not get to them until towards the end, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll probably get some of these answered as we go. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started here. So, Nora, right. the, the first question I always ask any of my guests is, what's the first experience you remember having with the horror genre? Um, I think for me, like, 
Uh, my mom really likes American Werewolf in London, so I watched that really early on, um, and Lost Boys. Those were, like, my two super early memories of getting into that. And then Poltergeist, obviously, because it's PG, so I think a lot of people kind of, that one goes under the radar because it's, like, a Steven Spielberg PG movie. It's still, like, terrifying. So, yeah, I love I love Poltergeist, too. Okay. And how did your love of the genre evolve from there? How did it develop? What... What was your methodology for injecting the horror into your veins and how did that develop over time? Um, I think just because of my age and the time when I was consuming the most and like going to the movies the most, um, for me it was like those early 2000s slasher movies um, were huge. I love like a, a early 2000s like campy, shitty, trashy like slasher movie is the best. I love like Valentine and Urban Legend I love Scream. That's not trashy at all, but I love Scream. Mm -hmm. uh, Ghostface is my favorite as far as like slasher movies go. Mm -hmm. Love, love the Scream movies. Um, the newest one was actually like up there for me. Yeah, I enjoyed Six Stop pretty well, Stop honestly. Movie. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> all right, and so over time, what what subgenres did you find yourself gravitating towards? Was it all slashers because of like scream kind of stuff? I mean, and you mentioned slashers, but was there any other subgenres that were attractive to you? Um, I love a ghost movie or like a haunted house movie, so I love all the Insidious movies. Um, shit, there's one that's very similar to Insidious. It's the one with uh, Ethan Hawke. Sinister. In it. Sinister. Sinister is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I love like a ghost movie. Um, not really into like the found footage okay. movies as much, like Paranormal Activity, not really my thing. But okay. um, just like a good ghost story is always, always solid. It's funny because, you know, that, that to an extent makes sense because someone that does the work that you do, that work is rarely appreciated in a found footage movie because yeah. it always goes by so quick because they can't actually show anything for very long lest anyone pick it apart. And, you know, when there's so little of it going on in found footage, um, when you pick apart the only thing that's there, that makes it a little tough. Um, so does that re does that just remain the case for you nowadays, just slasher and paranormal too, or do you... No, no, I'm super open. I'm, I'm really open. Um, I watched, like, an aquatic horror movie the other day. Don't ask me what it was called. I can't remember. Okay. <laughs> But no, I, I like uh, all different kinds of subgenres of horror. Um, but I, I like to have a good time too. Like I love like the stoner horror comedy genre. Like Idle Hands is one of my favorite movies of all time. Yep, love Idle, Idle Hands. Hands. Um, Faculty, like just kind of that again that that time period. Like for me, is very I'm very drawn and attracted to that that moment of time in cinema for whatever reason. I think just because it's nostalgic, because I grew up on it, and I still enjoy those movies just as much now as I did then. Yeah, I I agree with you on that. And one of the more recent examples of kind of the uh, the horror comedies that I've really been a fan of that uh, that really went after the '80s slasher genre was the final girls i love the final girl have you seen that one yeah actually my buddy cody who uh did a bunch of work with me on never hike alone 2 worked on final girls oh really um, yeah that's awesome no, 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 sorry no you know what i'm wrong i'm thinking oh. of tragedy girls oh tragedy girls okay tragedy girls. yeah no the final girls was the one with taisa formiga where they get sucked yeah. into the the basically the jason slasher movie that's what it is yeah no that one was cool i like the kind of heady like you know like um, fantastical nature of that movie, you know, like kind of like, well, this wouldn't really happen, but it's happening in this movie. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I like that movie a lot. I have seen that. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, since we brought up kind of the other subgenres, I do usually at some point do a rapid fire on the subgenre list that I have, and you just give me a yay or a nay here. Okay. So we know slashers you like, we know paranormal you like, you're not a fan of found footage. Um, you do like horror comedy. What about like serial killer true crime horror? It's a yay, but not if it's done like shitty or like like I love like like Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Great, I re enjoyed the Dahmer series, um, the Gacy movie with uh, I can't remember the actor's name, but there's everyone knows what I'm talking about. There's one Gacy movie that is far superior to the others. Gotcha. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't... My wife really likes true crime a lot more than me, so she'll end up putting those kind of, like, more crime-related, like, movies on. 
Um, but I do like serial killers. Uh, I like watching movies about them, but I definitely uh, enjoy podcasts about them more than movies about them maybe okay awesome yeah. uh if you're if you're interested um i did an interview earlier today for a channel called danny after dark and she does a lot of true crime coverage on her channel oh, so cool. if anyone's interested check check her out um all right what about uh psychological horror like the more heady stuff um i liked uh seven and there's a movie that angelina jolie did with ethan hawk Another Ethan Hawke movie. Um, and he played like a serial killer in it. That wasn't The Bone Collector, was it? No, it wasn't Bone Collector. Oh, no, that I think that might have been someone else anyway, maybe, actually. Shit, that. that's going to drive me nuts now that I'm bringing <laughs> these fucking names to. But, um, yeah, no, I, I like a psychological thriller. It's not, lately, I've been a little more like escapism, in the route of escapism, as far as like nothing too heavy. Okay. So I guess I like my horror a little lighter, a little campier. Um, I like, uh, like Italian horror slasher movies though, okay. which are more like those crime based, like giallo movies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. You get down on a giallo for sure. Okay. Awesome. Um, what about the religious side of things? I know sometimes people wrap that up in paranormal, but some people keep it separate, you know, demons and exorcisms and stuff like that. I can get down with that. Okay. I can get down with a good, a good demon, a good possession movie. Um, obviously, uh, Pope's Exorcist. I saw that. That was really cool. The yeah. makeup was beautiful. Um, I'm super excited about the new Exorcist movie that Blumhouse is putting out. Yeah. So that looks wicked. So no, I, I, I can get down with some possession. Yeah, I'm excited about that movie too. There's, it's, it's already so divisive. There's so many people that are so up in, up in arms against the believer and um the the it, they've already announced the sequel right because it's supposed to be a trilogy just like the halloween trilogy oh okay yeah yeah so this one is believer the next one is deceiver and the 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 positing is that the third one will be redeemer so well, hopefully they don't butcher it by the third one <laughs> yeah maybe not unlike another franchise okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> what about um, dark fantasy or folk horror? Yeah, like, um, well, even, even like time period horror, I feel like can kind of go into that. Like The Witch was really good. Yeah. Um, I was thinking like Pan's Labyrinth kind of thing, like, you know, certain things sure. like that. Mm -hmm. All like Guillermo del Toro stuff, um, you know, The Orphanage, The Boy, Pan's Labyrinth, um, anything with cool creatures, definitely. I mean, I think when you get into that fantasy, dark fantasy realm, you get some really cool creature concept work that can happen. Um, you can also get really doofy looking shit though too. So it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a catch 22, but yeah, no, definitely. I like a good creature feature. Werewolves are my favorite creature. They're not too fantastical, but um, okay. yeah. Favorite okay. creature, werewolf. Favorite yeah. creature, werewolf. All right, yeah, because creature features was next. Um, but yeah, sometimes they do cross over, right? Like my favorite creature put to cinema is the the big creature from the ritual the 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 deer creature that's like got the body on top and yep. it's so fucking cool looking um but yeah I, creature features have always been my personal favorite so um always have a big fan of that what about like you know real animal attack movies like jaws and the alligator movies and things like that I did crawl. That's like a hurricane movie favorite. If we're having a hurricane here in Florida, usually me and Rachel will throw crawl on before the power goes out. That's funny. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's, I love that one. Um, Cocaine Bear, not really a scary movie, but Cocaine Bear was fucking great. Cocaine Bear was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I swear on here? I'm yeah, sorry. absolutely, a hundred percent. Yeah. Fuck um, yeah. yeah. Fuck yeah. Uh, no, yeah, no. Again, my wife, she likes a really intense shit, and she does the, you know, like the, you know, camping in the woods bear attack movies more often than I do. But uh, no, I do enjoy. <sighs> animal death is tough. If there's a lot of like animals eating people, okay. Animal eating animal, you know, I think that's rough for for uh, for everybody. No one wants to see a poor little defenseless animal get ripped apart. No, that's so, true. Like, um, okay, so that I mean, there there's also uh, horror sci-fi. Obviously, that's your event horizons, your aliens, your predators, all that good stuff. Space freaks me out. Okay. So yeah, horror sci-fi. <laughs> sound like a pussy. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I like horror light. Um, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Like space is 
fucking scary. Space mm-hmm. is really scary. So anything that takes place in space, in a space station, uh, confined spaces where it's like impossible or deadly to leave, like that's all very um, effective when it comes to freaking me out. That stuff yeah. really. Yeah. Um, kind of like in the same vein as like aquatic horror there's nowhere to really go like uh was it underwater underwater I, yeah dude underwater was fucking awesome to talk <laughs> about tension it built so much tension right away yeah in the, like two minutes um yeah no very effective space scary space. yeah the the fact yeah yeah the fact that underwater turned it up that turned out being a backdoor cthulhu movie you know what i mean so oh. awesome but yeah, I, honestly, space is scary enough to me where like Gravity, which isn't considered a horror movie, was considered oh, yeah. a horror movie to me because <laughs> Jesus, yeah, that's that. I mean, those situations would have been absolutely terrifying and stuff, you know. Forget about it. I'll <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before we get to the horror side of what you do professionally, how did you get into like makeup effects and special effects and all that good stuff? Um, I always did like art was always like my strongest thing like that I did growing up academics were you know like average normal but art was always where I excelled um and I just always loved horror movies so I was always drawing like dead people and just weird shit um but I was confined to just drawing and then um kind of in my mid-20s I saw like the Savini school online and I decided like all right like I didn't go to college traditionally so like that would be a cool program that I'd be interested in and I just went for it and um that was kind of it from there I just kind of went for it um and it all worked out very well so right on uh excellent well so do you okay so I gotta take this one step at a time here um what beyond uh you know anything you might have already mentioned were do you think like the three most influential uh, effects in film that like spurred you to want to do what you're doing um i think the evil dead movies for sure had like a big influence on me like a lot of the k and b effects early work was definitely like super like influential Hello. Hello. Okay, cool. Got it back. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I don't know why it froze up on us. All good. What'd you catch? Um, well, you, you barely just started and then it kind of froze. So. Um, Evil Dead 2. Really, yeah, Evil really Dead. Evil right. Dead 2. Okay. Um, all those makeups, just all like Henrietta and Evil Ed and just like all the physicalities of those makeups and just everything that i feel like those makeups went through but yeah that movie really sparked a lot for me obviously the transformation in american world in london is iconic it's one of a kind um but that one was huge um third one um i mean just everything i mean really i mean because i was watching you know like the universal monsters movies were like kind of a tradition around Halloween time and like Abbott and Costello me you know Frankenstein and shit like that so my parents really started me early on on just classic black and white you know horror movies we listened to a lot of suspense theaters so I think horror just in general kind of enveloped a lot of my character and my passions so okay. like going into makeup effects being an artist and liking horror just all kind of made sense right on okay and so what what do you consider your first sort of big break into the into the professional FX world? Uh, I think doing face off obviously didn't hurt. Okay. Um, that was that was very helpful, um, especially going on and winning face off. That was super helpful mm -hmm. um, as far as like getting my name out there to people, getting me at conventions so I could meet people. Conventions were a great way of networking. Um, got a lot of like my first movie gigs from meeting this guy, uh, Matt at um, mad monster arizona like way way back okay and i had my portfolio with me started talking to him he owned a studio out in uh, california near where i live and i ended up doing a bunch of work with him and had a great time and i have a great working relationship with him so i mean it's it just being available and like networking i think were super important like just taking advantage of those opportunities when you meet people um so yeah, I just think all the conventions really helped me meet a lot of people. I met Bill Mosley, got hooked up with him, started doing the chop top makeups, 
at conventions with him. So, I mean, yeah, just like, it just helped me have opportunities to meet people, being invited to shows, going to conventions, talking to people, meeting people, networking. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Right on. Well, <clears throat> just sticking with Face Off for just a second here, what what made you decide to get involved in that show? Had you been watching it previously or did someone just tell you about it or how did that work? No, I've been a fan of that show for like years since it came out. Okay. Um, so I was like aware of the show. I liked the show. And then going to Savini school, it just is something that they like push a lot, you know, because a lot of graduates have gone on the show. Um, so they... Uh, make it easy for you to apply to the show as far as like the information you need and we did like a q a skyping thing with like producers from the show like in like an auditorium at school so um yeah i just said like whatever i'm gonna do it um i actually didn't i, I was super I'm, I'm a little bit of a pr procrastinator okay <laughs> so i don't think i even submitted my video to like the last day and i decided very last minute that i was gonna do it um and i just went for it um yeah nice okay yeah. <clears throat> do you have any particular uh pieces that were your favorite that you got to make on the show uh, i think all my finale makeups were really fun it was like a huge collaborative effort with a bunch of amazing artists so that was just really cool to have that many hands on something um and i just like the way those guys turned out a lot um yeah i think those are some of my favorite makeups from from the show right on so what are a couple of the of of the projects that you've gotten to work on that you've been like you know maybe like either surprised you got to work on it or that people might be surprised to know you got to work on it because it's not you know widely publicized what are what are some of those do you think um when i was out in los angeles the last three years that i was out there i was working for a company called thingergy and we did a lot of sci-fi shows so I got to work on like Mandalorian, which is really cool. Season one and two, I did a lot of, uh, painted a lot of armor for that. And we fabricated a lot of armor for that show. Nice. Um, Orville, I got to sculpt and fabricate some cool spacesuits for that. A lot of painting. Um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of space, a lot of sci-fi, which is cool. Not really my favorite thing in the world though. My wife kept getting to work on really cool shit, like scary stories to tell in the dark and like just really cool, like horror things. And I'm like, I got to work on some Star Wars stuff. It was cool. You know, like, and it is cool. And other people get super jazzed about it. And I was excited. I got to go on set for Mandalorian once, which was really fucking cool. That's awesome. Um, dude, it was, that was like one of the coolest on set experiences I've had as far as like the biggest production I've been on. I feel like it doesn't get much bigger than that unless you're doing like a big, huge you know, movie. Um, but yeah, TV wise, that was really cool. <laughs> you might be one of the only people ever to have uttered, I, I, I only got to work on Star Wars or like, you know, I worked, I was working on Star Wars in a disappointed tone. <laughs> I know. And my boss is probably sitting there. My old boss probably going, what the fuck? <laughs> no, no, no. But, but you know, everyone's got their preferences, right? So, so what would be your, like, what would make you the most excited? Is it all horror stuff or would it be more fantasy type stuff? Or like, what oh, would no. really... Get you the going. horror stuff would yeah. definitely like if I got to do like gory, you know, like American Horror Story would be amazing, or like um, uh, anything Mike Flanagan. I would kill to work for Robert Kurtzman and do a Mike Flanagan production. Nice, Robert, if you're listening. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I would love like that's that's definitely like a bucket list. Like Fever Dream is like doing something with Mike Flanagan. I'm a very very big Mike Flanagan supporter and fan. Nice. Yeah. So, like, I did see on IMDb, obviously IMDb can be wrong, but it said that you got to work a little bit on The Predator and maybe a little mm -hmm. bit on one of the Jurassic Worlds. Are those correct? Yes, yes. And The Nun. Um, those nice. Those were all at the same shop. Yeah, those were all at uh, this shop called ADI, which is not a shop anymore, unfortunately. Um, but it was owned by Alec Gillis and Dave Woodruff, and they actually won um, an Oscar for Death Becomes Her. Oh, wow. Um, of the guys behind death becomes her and alien um and most of the predator movies um they worked on like all of those from the different um films in the franchises um but yeah i got to work on fallen kingdom and i got to work on the 2018 predator um and then yeah the nun i got to make some bodies some some hanging dead nuns oh nun. okay all right on bullshit so yeah it was uh yeah we did a lot of cool stuff there um and they definitely had a really cool scope and variety of what kind of shows they did but i got to work on some really big stuff there yeah right on 
what haven't you gotten to do in the special uh, special effects arena that you still want to do? <laughs> um, I think for me it would be doing an on set gig for a television show for like a whole production of a show for a season. Um, you know, I've done spots on shows. I've done, you know, movies throughout their entire production or just, you know, day spots or weekend spots, but doing a television series for like a season start to finish would be really cool. And I haven't gotten to do that. Okay. Okay. Do you have like, do you, are you looking to eventually be like someone that would lean your uh, lead your own uh, effects team and something like that, or do you just are you are you good like just making sure you're you do the best that you can for your part and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, always try to do the best you know that I can for whatever production I'm working on, whether that's big or small. Um, but yeah, right now, so obviously I'm not in LA anymore. I'm living out in Florida, and I have a more or less a normal job, I guess you could say at the moment. So I'm doing my independent work, you know, with you and Womp Stomp, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of my outlet at the moment. I'm still doing conventions. I'm going to do um, Spooky Empire in the fall with Bill Mosley. We're going to do Chop 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 Top Makeup. Nice. Um, but yeah, I think that for now, you know, I, the, the adult job has helped me, you know, buy a house and, you know, afford to do, you know, the life step stuff you know yeah to get to the next step or whatever so um getting to do a couple of productions a year scratches the itch for me right now there you go um, will i ever get back into full-time film work who knows doors definitely not closed on that um i think it all depends on opportunity and stuff um but right now i'm still getting to do effects work every day i work for a medical simulation company and i work doing like um full-size silicone bodies for for medical research um, and for medical training. So that's, you know, it's still really cool. I get to paint a lot of bodies. I get to sculpt. I get to see him. I still get to, get to do everything I would normally do out in LA. It's just for medical purposes. That's cool, though. That's such yeah. a great way to utilize your skills and keep them, keep them sharp and everything. Oh, yeah. Um, so what do you think would you consider your most fun and, and rewarding experience from throughout your special effects career so far? Uh, I mean, Face Off obviously was, you know, kind of like the the beginning of it all, you know, the the jumping point, and that was a incredible experience. But I think since getting into things, I mean, really getting to work with, you know, and finding like my film tribe. So like getting to work with Lom Stomp and you, and uh, you know, doing the Never Hike movies, and you know, doing Dylan's New Nightmare. Uh, those are my favorite onset experiences, just because it's such a um, different onset experience. Okay. You know what I'm talking about, man. No, it, you know, it's just, it's awesome. It's not the same. It's not conventional. You know, we're getting shit done and it looks amazing, but we're doing it our way and yeah. with our people. And um, there's just a certain, a certain way we do things on Womp Stomp sets and I love it. And it's just, uh, you know, everyone's there to get the shit done, but we're also there to have fun and we're all passionate and fans of what we're doing and what we're working on. So um, yeah, I love a good Womp Stomp joint. Yeah, and it seems like everyone uh, seems to, well, for the most part, everyone seems to really appreciate the work that we end up putting out there, at least so far for, for Dylan's New Nightmare. You, you've you been on a number of projects that have had wonderful, uh, you know, responses, so that obviously has to speak to your quality as, uh, as an artist, so... Um, now, what do you think would be the most challenging experience that you've had to deal with in your career? Hmm. I figured that might also kind of be uh, face off because you know that's probably oh. not the typical work environment uh, that you have. Yeah, no, face off is like it's like makeup boot camp. You know, I mean you're you're like conceptualizing and sculpting and molding and applying, you know, and creating a makeup start to finish in like less than twenty four hours when you boil it down to how much time they're actually giving you for each step of the process. Mm -hmm. So it's just insane. It's not realistic. It's fucking bananas. Like it's a very unique bubble of an environment that you're in because you're just don't worry about what you're eating. Don't worry about your bills. Don't worry about anything. Just sculpt and mold and do makeup. So it's just you don't have to fucking think about anything. You just you turn all those other switches off and you just like hyper focus on this one thing. Hmm. So it's a unique environment to be in as an artist because there's no other opportunity like that. You know, on set is like as close as you get to the intensity level, but it's just um, a very rare thing to be able to turn every other thing off and just focus on that solely and not have to worry about anything else. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. But also like working on the indie film sets can be really 
difficult too, you know, due to restrictions, whether it's, you know, oh, we're only working outside and we don't have a trailer and you got to do this makeup out of the back of your car or, you know, it's fucking snowing and like 10 degrees out or, you know what I mean? So it's, there's always challenges with, uh, environment too, shooting outside. Um, I was shooting up in this place called Lone Pine where they shot a bunch of exterior shots for like Iron Man and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was like desert and all these big, like, rocks and boulders and shit and then like a snow-capped mountain and it started snowing in the middle of our production we had to stop for like an hour and wait for the snow to clear because we're shooting like an alien desert you know movie oh jeez yeah just, there's just stuff like that where you just can't control um nature and yeah you just don't know what's gonna happen <laughs> um yeah bigger budget they'll just uh they'll just you know fix it all with money that's what they tend yep. to do um <laughs> All right, well, getting to the Dylan's new nightmare of it all. So specifically, what 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 made you actually jump on to the project, to your recollection? Um, well, let's see. I think I want to say, like, Vinny probably talked to me about it first, I think. What do you remember? I'm trying to read. So, so my recollection is when I was out helping with, because he shot Disappear before he shot Snow, right? Yes. So I think I was out helping with Disappear, and we were setting up camp uh, in the, you know, on the cement platform that didn't have a roof, yeah. right, um, behind all of the buildings that we were using and stuff like that. And and he introduced me to you, and over the course of the day, like, you were, again, so approachable and so nice, and I mentioned to you that I was a fan of Face Off, and, and specifically you and your season and everything, and... And I just at some point told you about, you know, the, the idea for Dylan's New Nightmare. And you were like, ooh, Freddy, you know. And yeah. uh, and I think that that's pretty much my recollection of it, you know. Yeah, no, okay. So, yeah, my memory is shit. Don't mind <laughs> me. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, yeah, anytime you have the opportunity to work on a Freddy movie. But really for me, like, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm pretty much game for whatever. Like, you got money and you got, you know, a script that doesn't suck. And you seem like you're cool to work with. Like... I just want to make movies too, you know, like I love being on set. So uh, I'm pretty willing to work with new people whenever I like just having the opportunity. You never know who you're going to work with that that next job is going to come from or recommendation or what have you. Um, so I always love to work with new filmmakers and, and crew and just um, widen the net, you know. Yeah, well, we very much appreciate it as, as one of those new filmmakers that you gave a, a chance to. Um, you know, and I do, assuming we get to finish Dylan's New Nightmare and people maintain the goodwill, I do have an original uh, slasher idea that, that you have, have expressed interest in doing the makeup effects for, which is oh, exciting. Yeah. So, yeah, hopefully we can get that going in the not terribly distant future. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so what, what do you think was your favorite part of working on Dylan's new nightmare? And again, this is not me fishing for anything. Don't think that at any point, but uh, it, you know, I, I just like, I like knowing everyone's individual experience on the, on the project. Yeah. No, I think for me, um, I mean, obviously getting to watch Freddie kind of slowly come to life, you know, being someone that had access to, you know, working and talking with Mikey and seeing the sculptures um, you know, I think that was just cool to watch it progress. And obviously we had to go on a bit of a hiatus due to the world ending and such. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was definitely exciting once things started getting going again and, and building momentum and, and things were actually, you know, moving forward. Um, yeah, I mean, just, uh, seeing the makeup on, on Dave for the first time. So it was kind of just every new stage of like that Freddy happening. And then I was just really excited for Miko to see him. Mm -hmm. um, that was super cool when we all, you know, came out um, with, with the makeup on Dave for the first time and the whole crew got to experience that together, seeing it. Um, Cause we kept it very hush hush up until then. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was wicked. That was really <laughs> cool. I tell you one of the funny things, one of the funny memories I'll always have is, um, so we have this, uh, this gentleman that that's helped out with the horror show for many years now. And he produced Dylan's new nightmare as well, um, by the name of Steve. And, uh, he's been in the business for many, many years at this point. And he came in that, that second day, right. Whereas the first day we're putting in uh, Freddie, uh, putting Dave into the Freddie makeup and he, you're, you're 
far enough along where the head is on the eyes haven't been blended yet or not you know but you've done a lot of the painting and stuff and i just saw it and steve came in he's like how's it going i was like steve you should go take a look in the makeup room real quick and he's like oh yeah i was like just trust me and so he went back and he came back out after a couple of minutes and he taps me on the shoulder i turn around he looks at me he goes holy shit <laughs> I was like, yeah, dude. Uh, Steve, definitely. So, yeah, no, I mean, it's a testament to your work for sure. Now, if we get to continue, uh, again, you don't know necessarily the story going forward. Not many people do. We, we've all bandied about ideas in the same room, and you've overheard things, sure, so be careful. But if you had your druthers, what kind of effect are you hoping we could maybe do with freddy or one of freddy's victims going forward um so i always really like when and i guess this is it has to do with me but i guess it would be more so for um kind of art department and like scenic department but um i love when you go into like the dream world like i love when we go into those weird like the mirror hallway or like the kind of like fleshy hallways or like the boiler room like i think going into like Freddy's place but like one of those traditional like Freddy places would be really cool um, but I love all that shit when you kind of go in you know in Dream Warriors they go into Freddy's world a lot and it's just such a cool atmospheric place and I feel like it's not too cheesy like as it gets into the other movies it gets cheesy but I feel like they were able to pull off going into Freddy's kind of fantastical nightmare world uh, from three you know and back without it getting corny so let me put you on to something um that i have been wanting to do in one of the next installments and how it'll get folded in i don't know but in my mind so when freddie is inside dylan's head and kind of watching um he's got sort of a base of operations and the way that i put it in my brain is like i'm imagining freddie has like set up shop like a sort of throne of brain synapses and and like veins and things that have kind of formed together to form a throne kind of like spawn's throne of bone in the alleyway i um, can build that for you yeah something like that where he's like yeah. watching and seeing through dylan's eyes and he's just like sitting there just you know watching and like that kind of thing just uh, just that whole environment that would be yeah. fucking cool Oh, we could definitely do something like that. That All would right. be very cool. All right, sweet, sweet. Because, yeah, sure. you could bring elements of his burned skin and stuff through it and all that good stuff. You I, know. I had to, I got to work on a really cool, like, body part chair for a short film. Um, it's called Stucco. And, yeah, very reminiscent. Nice. That would be very fun to do. Hell yeah. Okay, right on. Um, so, okay. And uh, on a broader scale, if you could have a crack at doing the effects of any movie, be it a franchise sequel, a remake, or a wholly brand new idea, but on the big budget scale, what would you like to get a, get your shot at? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, that's such a big question, Broad, like you said. Um, jeepers. Well, all right, so... Um, this is tough because you, then you get into like remake territory and it's kind of like, eh, you know, but um, I'm a huge Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan. Um, okay. So if they were to do like a Buffy show or a Buffy movie that didn't totally fucking suck, um, I think that was another show that was very influential as far as like having like that creature of the week and there was always fun demons, always vampires. They had so many beautiful fucking makeups in that show. Um, so something like that with a bunch of really cool characters and makeups would be really neat to work on, like a horror version of Guardians of the Galaxy kind of thing. They've done a comic book series, and, and kind of a couple of them at this point, but they've done a main comic book series where it's like Old Man Logan, except for Buffy. And so, like, she's still out there slaying, but, like, the, the story is finally a new slayer is is born and like there's you know she is forced to like go and catch up with her friends they're all estranged now and stuff like that like i could see that being done like a one-off season like they did maybe dexter bringing it back you know what i mean yeah that could be pretty cool to work on right on okay 
Um, so what do you think you like the most about the horror genre, whether it be inspiration or whether it be what you like to work on? Like what, what draws you to the genre so much? I think, um, you know, maybe as a kid, I mean, I very much had like a morbid sensibility. I always just really was attracted to like horror and stuff. So I think, um, I just related to it. Um, and I think that like, uh, you know, either the bad guy wins or like the little guy wins. It was never like the asshole, you know, it was always like the underdog, you know, would prevail if, if a good guy was going to prevail, um, uh, most of the time. And, and that was, you know, attractive also, um, as far as, you know, the good triumphing over evil thing. But, um, yeah, I don't know. For some reason it was just, I was fascinated by it. It was just, I think also the fantastical nature of it's something outside of this world so it's way more interesting and uh you know cooler than reality you know wouldn't wouldn't the world be more interesting if there were uh, vampires and werewolves you know roaming about mm -hmm. um yeah i just loved it as a kid and still holds true as an adult so is there an element and forgive me this is not me trying to be presumptive or accusatory or anything but is there an element someone that likes to work in special effects for the horror genre right their their work tends to be much more noticeable and in people's face whereas special effects artists for like heavy dramas or things like that right the special effects are meant to be hidden right so the measure of success is not knowing that special effects artists were involved versus the measure of success in horror is how well did the special effects people do for the the stuff that's pre presented is there any of that that goes into deciding to work on horror maybe not you specifically maybe uh, with people that you worked with along the way you know did they did everyone are, are there people with different motivations for being in the horror side of things special effects wise um i think that there are some I think a lot of the people that do horror kind of, they also do both. I mean, there's a lot of people that are just amazing artists that work on, you know, like Mikey, for example, he'll sculpt monster stuff all day, but he can also sculpt some beautiful, delicate, you know, facial prosthetics for a serious drama. Um, there's, you know, kind of no limitations to, you know, it's kind of just whatever the job is. We don't always have the luxury of getting, you know, to work on whatever we want. So sometimes you're just sculpting, you know, um, basic ass shit or you know stuff that's outside of the horror you know genre so i think um it's always awesome when you get to work on something that's horror but nine times out of ten at a studio you're probably not gotcha. um unless you work for like a smaller studio that just does like you know the the b horror movies or they do you know regular horror shows or whatever um and i think sure like horror movies lower budget ones you can get away with doing like shitty makeup so maybe there's certain artists that are attracted to not less challenging work but just that kind of work specifically like there's some shops that that's their bread and butter that's how they pay the bills and it's fun and it's easy and it's not necessarily easy but it's just you get to go a little more over the top and it's not so much realism it's you know fantastic and it doesn't have to be like Grey's Anatomy perfect you know it can be a little more over the top um yeah, so I think there's challenges in both and really awesome um, accomplishments that you can feel doing both, you know, whether it's something really subtle or something really crazy and over the top. Um, I think if people respond to it, it just feels, you know, like you did the job right. Right on. Um, has there ever been anything that someone's asked you to do that you've been like, look, that's just not how it would be? Like, you know, I, I came to you asking about you know arm sushi although you coined the term arm sushi i will give you credit for that i love that and i still say it although we had a few people call them swiss rolls after uh, <laughs> and i was like that's funny too but um but like you know has has anyone said hey we're looking to do this and you're like yeah that's maybe a bit too far maybe that's not for me to do i don't know anything like that um I never shy away from a challenge. So if someone has a crazy idea, I usually want to try and accommodate and say like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. And then just figure it out on the back half, how to actually have to make it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, like Vinny's, you know, ax in the mouth, you know, trying to make, you know, figure that out. Hadn't done that before, but I'll figure it out. Sure. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. um, 
But there's always times sometimes where people will come up with shit and you just have to kind of walk them back from the edge a little and go, listen, this isn't going to look like how you are imagining it in your head. Let's do this or that or change this slightly. And I promise it's going to look the way you're thinking. But sometimes people just don't know how um, a gag will translate or if it's, you know, I can make that look real or like, no, I'm never going to be able to make that look real enough mm. without a little help from, you know, computer editing, you know, on the back half. So... Yeah, sometimes you have to tell people, unfortunately, this would be better in CG or this would be better to imply or, you know, not show the action and just show the aftermath. So there's a lot of compromise, hopefully, between directors and uh, NFX artists when it comes to, to making something look as good as possible and not not make sense because it's yeah. so much physicality into an effect, especially like a live effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um how did you go about deciding to bring Mikey on to Dylan's New Nightmare? Oh, um, that was just an awesome coincidence that he was even available and willing to do it, to be honest. So, I mean, I just, if it was like, oh, like, if I could have anybody sculpt this, who would that be? And it would be Mikey. And luckily, I, I knew Mikey. We were friendly. Um, so it was... I just hit him up, you know, it was COVID. I was like, you know, I'm not working. No one's really working. Maybe, maybe he's just sitting at home sculpting, you know, like maybe I could hire him for something. And I was able to, and he was super excited. He's a huge Freddy fan. Um, so that was just sheer dumb luck and good timing that he wasn't too busy and, and wanted to take it on. And he was just super excited about the project. Uh, the second I, you know, told him what, what it was. Yeah, he uh, and he's been very pleased with the response as well. So that's that's wonderful. And uh, I asked him his side of the story too when I did his interview. His interview will go up after your interview because I want to cool. make sure I do it certain order of operations. But um, yeah, I was just curious for for your side of that because I, it was a genius move, and I'm so glad that you brought him in because man, did it you know obviously everyone. Yeah. Everyone loves the look, and I, I, I personally have been a better person to do it. No, I mean, I personally think it's the the best Freddy makeup, but you know, obviously, I'm a bit biased as far as that goes. <laughs> um, so uh, there has been a couple of questions. We'll get to that. One of them is from Dice Roland. As someone with a sincere interest in special effects and creating them, what is your advice for an SFX baby? That was one of my questions as well. Any tips for aspiring makeup effects or uh, special effects artists out there? Um, I think it, you know, all depends on what you want to do. You know, if you want to get on set and do effects, then start networking, you know, with film people, start going to, you know, movie conventions, you know, try to, you know, or find people in your state and locally that are making movies that need someone to do it. Um, practice makeups on yourself. But I mean, with the indie stuff and just film work in general, you really have to break in from the ground up and it's important to know people. If you want to do like haunt makeup stuff, that's also like, you know, you just practice on yourself and go for it. Apply to a haunt, um, you know, watch YouTube videos, go to makeup school. Um, you know, I think it's all just about putting yourself out there and finding your thing also. Like if you also have something that's very brand recognizable and you want to make a product to sell to people, um, finding that specific look or that thing that makes your thing different or special is super important. So if you have like a really signature, sorry, my cat's jumping in. If you have like a very signature style, sculpting style or anything like that, um, that's recognizable that people are going to be into, that's like a great way also to kind of hit the ground running. Okay. Are there, are there, is it common to get like apprentices or mentors and stuff in the makeup community? Or is it more, like you said, sort of just building relationships through meeting people kind of thing? It can happen both ways. Um, there's been a lot of people that um, I know that have taken on, a, you know, apprentices, and there's people I know that have, have gotten to be mentored by really amazing people. So it definitely does happen, um, and those people are super lucky when it does. You know, I was fortunate enough to get a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one time with Tom Savini and, and spend a lot of time with him. So you know, that was really cool and helpful getting to ask him questions and you know tips or you know, hey tom i gotta do this you know what would you do how would you do this you know if someone asked you to do this effect and getting to you know talk to him about stuff and work with him through you know some effects early on in my career was uh you know um couldn't couldn't ask for better help you know what i mean like couldn't really 
do much better than getting Tom Savini to help you figure a gag out, you know? So just very lucky. Yeah. The, um, I was going to say, like, do you remember like one thing in particular that, that Tom said that kind of stuck with you as far as, uh, something you applied and, and what you, what you did later down the line? Or is it just like, it just was so much that you just assimilated oh, I mean, a, a ton, but you know, honestly, one of like the most important things and it wasn't even, it was way before I was on Face Off. It was when. <laughs> we, uh, we're almost there. We got. Uh, so, okay, you said it was before Tom Savini, or no, it was, sorry, before Face Off. Um, but go ahead, yeah. what you were saying. So, when you, when every semester starts at. The Savini School, he gives kind of like this speech, he does like orientation, and he gives this elevator, you know, pitch speech basically at the beginning, which is, you know, that you never know who you're going to meet at, you know, uh, an interview, and you never know who you're going to be riding the elevator with, so always have your portfolio on you, whether it's on a file on your phone, or on a pen drive, and you have your laptop, or a physical, you know, hard copy, like always have your work handy to show someone, because you never know who you're going to bump into, you know, in the elevator or whatever. It's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, for me, that was, like, again, super important. Went to a convention, went to Mad Monster in Arizona in, like, 2017 or 16 and met um, this guy, Matt Vitella, who owns um, Soda Effects Studio. And he gave me a bunch of jobs because I had my portfolio with me. And I ran up to my hotel room and I got it and I brought it down and I showed it to him. And I did tons of work with him um, just based off, you know, obviously working together, having a good experience on set, but getting that opportunity initially was just having my shit ready to go to show him right away. And my portfolio wasn't anything special. It was all my crap from school. It was n it was not good. Um, <laughs> but it was just being like, yeah, I've got this with me. Like, yeah, here's my business card. Here's, you know, I can show you stuff. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, just being professional and being prepared because um, you just never know when it might be like, it's time like fucking turn it on you know like get that's awesome good job. Yeah. no that's that's a great piece of advice honestly always be ready and you know don't be afraid to take the opportunity because you never know when you're going to get it again that's why i approached so many celebrities that we ended up getting interviews for we got an interview with george romero specifically because um and we didn't specifically target this but we were at Scarefest in like 2015 or 2016 and he was there and he had a, you know, someone working with him the whole time from the event. And it, at one point, Fuego asked me like, Hey, should I go see if we could interview George? And I was like, yeah, go for it. And so he walked over there and came back. He's like, he said, yes, but we got to go like right now. And I was like, okay. And it turns out that his, his person w had walked away and gone to the bathroom and Fuego approached when she wasn't there and so george was like yeah sure come on and yeah. i ran over in time that we were already in the middle of the interview by the time his handler came back and so we actually got an interview with george romero just because we happened to be timely with it and we didn't wait you know what i mean so awesome. you never know you never know so yep. um so do you have uh like a next big thing people can look out for or to something that you're looking to work on or like what what is uh, what's the next thing that you're excited about the next thing i'm excited about is never hike alone 2 coming out uh in october i'm super super excited for that that's the next big thing i got um it's the last thing i shot okay. um and yeah other than that i don't have much else going on spooky empire in the fall as well so october will be a, a nice busy month but yeah, never hike too. I'm super excited about that conclusion. You know that 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 coming to an end and that um, getting out to the people. So I cannot wait for you guys to see what we have in Never Hike Alone too. Because yeah, yeah, go go ahead and just tell us the effects that you did. Oh yeah, I'll just I'll just yeah, <laughs> Vinny will love that. Vinny will love that. <laughs> <laughs> um all right cool well yeah guys stay tuned for that never hike alone 2 coming october 13th um just make sure you watch dylan's new nightmare a bunch more times before that comes out and starts dominating the entire horror sphere um we're age restricted now we need help with the views i want to i was hoping we'd be able to eventually get to a milli but uh but yeah that age restriction is going to slow that process way down but uh but anyway the youth we got to figure out how to <laughs> You know they can get around. Yeah, we gotta we gotta get some attention on the tickety talks. 
I actually do have it on TikTok in like five different like pieces because you can't you can only do a certain length of time. Um, but bump it, out to, bump it out to the foreigners. Bump it out to some. Put it in Spanish. Put it in Russian. Put it yeah. In I actually just finished doing the English subtitles myself because the automatic subtitles were trash. So I did all the actual dialogue and everything. So that's all there. Now people can go ahead and translate it to uh, to other languages. So we can start to do that, actually. That's, uh, that's part of what we want to do. Um, we're getting some people saying, love your work. Uh, Luigi yes. Costa and uh, Tiffany uh, Shante in the in the chat, if I'm saying that right. Uh, Mary Braven, uh, uh, Dice Roland been very interactive. Tyler Adams as well. New Nightmare uh, Nightly in the chat. Hey Nora, uh, since ten dollars super chat. Hope you and Rachel are doing well. I need to reiterate how amazing y'all are. You both, uh, you're both so kind, and it's amazing knowing y'all as friends. Rock on. Hope you're doing no, well too, you, Cecil. Nightly. Thank you, Knightley. I appreciate it. Keep an eye out for Knightley's work. He's an up-and-comer. He's going to do big things. Indeed. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, great convo, says Tyler Adams. Looking forward to the DNN sequel. Thank you very much. Yep, that yes, that's uh, that will be coming down the line, and, and hopefully, uh, eventually, we'll be able to see that slasher that, that we mentioned briefly um, that Nora's going to help bring to life. So. Oh, yeah. So there you go, guys. That's going to do it. Thank you all very much for watching. Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting the channel the way that you do. Um, where's the best place to for people to follow you and your work? Oh, I'm on Instagram at uh, BadfishSFX. And I'm on old Facebook, old <laughs> faithful Facebook, uh, as Nora Hewitt-Gervig. There you go. So I do have... Nora's Instagram in the description box down below. Go ahead and just click that link there if you want to follow. But thank you again, Nora, for taking the time. And tell Rachel thank you for, for um, you know, giving us uh, you for this, uh, this, this time today. Oh, she doesn't mind at all. <laughs> A little bit of time to herself. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I'll be in touch soon. And thank you all again. Until next time, I've been Cecil Laird. That's been Nora Hewitt. And remember, stay scared. And and str